ask your own questions either in the chat or um, over uh, YouTube or Facebook, depending on how you are watching this, um, feel free to drop a question so that um, the panel that we uh, brought together today of subject matter experts from the university and the community um, can answer those questions. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to all of my colleagues um, from Pitt serves as well as the Office of Engagement and Community Affairs and everyone that worked diligently to put together a week um, focused on civil engage, civic engagement, excuse me, uh, as well as just giving back. Uh, this week is very important. We'll be ending um, in Homewood with uh, two volunteer events, one on Friday um, and Saturday, well, each on Friday and Saturday, both with Operation Better Block. You can find more information on the Civic Action Week website. So without further ado, I would like to pass this mic over to our moderator, um, the phenomenal, the energetic, um, the person who's going to make sure that this conversation is engaging and more, Alyssa Lyon, who leads the Black Environmental Collective. Thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you at the end of this conversation. Thank you. Oh, almost forgot. I want to thank John Rubin <laughs> and Satish uh, Iyengar um, of Science Revealed. They're out of the Dietrich School of Arts and Sciences. We would not be here if it um, were not for them and Science Revealed um, for um, bringing us together. So thank you. Alyssa? Yes, Darren, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for introducing me. Thank you for even thinking about excuse me, the Urban Kind Institute and the Black Environmental Collective to partner with you all here today. Once again, as Darren said, my name is Alyssa Lyon. I'm the director of the Black Environmental Collective at the Urban Kind Institute. We have a ton of information to get through today, awesome information, awesome subject matter expert, experts, an array of thoughts. Um, so we're gonna jump right in and talk about safe water in Homewood and safe water throughout Pittsburgh. First, I wanna stop here and thank our hosts, um, especially the University of Pittsburgh um, to host this Civic Week, our partners and our palin panelists, and of course, our participants and the people watching today. So we're just going to get right to it. Why are we here? Darren kind of jumped a little bit into why we're here, but the specific question that was on our flyer and that we asked ourselves as we were planning is, how are water challenges in Pittsburgh neighborhoods connected to the larger global fight for en environmental justice? Um, we got here with the recognition saying, okay, we know that Pittsburgh, you know, we take pride in being the steel city. We take pride in all of our history. Uh, and some of those things come with some detrimental harm to some of the people who lived here and who have lived here historically um, throughout their lives. Um, and you will talk to one of those people on our panel later today. But I wanted to stop here and ground us, or rather, since we're talking about water, swim us in some facts around Pittsburgh's water. Um, and our experts are going to get a little bit more into our water, um, why we should be paying a little bit more attention to it here in our region, but I wanted to just give you guys a little bit of an idea of what some of our historically marginalized groups are facing um, with dealing with some of these natural resources that are turning out to be harmful to us. All right. We all know that environmental justice communities like the one that I live here in Braddock, uh, some of those front, a majority of those frontline communities are inhabited by people of color and other historically marginalized groups. So we're well aware of the environmental justice or injustice concerns that are plaguing our black, our brown, our, our uh, pov uh, impoverished communities. And we want to start to actively acknowledge and actively address those things. So once again, let's swim in some facts. Pittsburgh's drinking water has been contaminated with lead since about 2016. Women for Healthy Environment came out with a report that said that the Pittsburgh drinking water has been violating the lead copper rule with lead levels above the federal action limit since about then. Now, since then, they've gone on to take on remediating, remediating tasks, such as looking at the pipelines in which our, the, line, the lines in which our water is running through, looking at water, how water is filtered, and also giving out facts on how to make sure that your water is clean and healthy for you to drink and or use. The next fact is 80% of Pittsburgh's water systems have detectable lead levels in their drinking water since about two years ago in 2019. And another small fact that we don't think about, water is a burden, okay? Water costs money. 
And water is going to cost more money if it's not traveling through the proper infrastructure channels in order to get to us in a proper way. Now, another fact is that people in southwestern Pennsylvania pay about pay larger utility bills than hey, some other people in the entire nation. So water costs more because it's a little bit, a little bit more harmful for us. And so we want to think about some of those things as we're thinking about um, today and grounding ourselves and swimming ourselves in this conversation. Some of these issues that exist today are part of the reason why uh, programs like mine and a myriad of others exist in Southwestern Pennsylvania. So I'll stop right here and do a shameless plug and tell you that I am the director of the Black Environmental Collective. And our mission is to advance solutions that support Black communities' ability to combat environmental threats to quality of life, to food in place, and climate change, okay? We are a, we are a network of 100 plus Black regional leaders, individuals, institutions, organizations, um, where we've created a space where we can quickly empathetically and responsibly respond to the needs of Black populations as environmental emergencies arise. We are committed to acting on the root causes of environmental discrimination in our region. And so this is one of the many reasons, uh, this conversation is one of the many things that we wanna engage in in order to draw your attention to some of these environmental justice issues. So before I pass it off to our panelists, before we get into an awesome riveting conversation, I'm, I have a couple of call to actions for you. Test and drink your, fil test and filter your drinking water, okay? Get yourself a Brita, boil that thing, get yourself some tools, um, test your drinking water, test the water that you're using, attend local meetings about these issues, okay? Sign up on your Twitter, follow someone on your Twitter around these issues, follow the Black Environmental Collective, uh, follow Clean Water Action, um, follow someone to kind of get yourself um, grounded in these local issues that also happen to be nationally re relevant, and let's not play the game of not knowing that environmental justice doesn't exist and environmental racism doesn't exist, let's start to act on it, okay? Those are my call to actions here. And now we're gonna get right into introducing our beautiful panel. The first person we have here is Natisha Washington. Natisha Washington is currently the environmental justice organizer at 1PA, where she hopes to assist more communities with their environmental injustices and needs. Being a Pittsburgh native, she's always had the goal of improving environment in her city and cities like it through planning on and hands-on work. Her community nonprofit work started at Operation Better Block right there in Homework, Homewood, where she put all of her efforts into planning out and improving green spaces in the neighborhood with OBB's Junior Corps, which worked with teens ages 14 to 18. She's partnered with many local environmental organizations to facilitate and implement projects like green for infrastructure building, reducing air pollution through tree planting, reducing lead contamination through soil testing, and hosting a multitude of community-focused and volunteer events. Fun fact, Natisha owns a consulting company called Washington's Green Solutions, where she educates and assists other groups on environmental topics and personal solutions. Natisha, we're very excited to have you here and the floor is yours. Thank you, that was a wonderful introduction. <laughs> Um, am I good to share my screen or do y'all have my presentation? Oh. All right. Um, oh. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as was said, I'm Natisha Washington. Um, I wanted to focus my presentation on um, water justice and accountability. In my work, I do a lot of environmental advocacy. So 1PA, we are a community advocacy group that is statewide. Um, we have stations both in Pittsburgh and in Philadelphia. And I work mostly in Allegheny County, working on air pollution issues, water pollution issues, um, and community advocacy as it relates to food access and all kinds of environmental injustices. So I wanted to first talk about what environmental justice organizing is really all about. So 
a lot of our organizers, we go out into the communities and we still knock doors. <laughs> Even during this whole COVID pandemic, we put our mask on, we get our boots on the ground and we go door to door to listen to our community because we need to hear what their issues are, what their experiences are, what's going on in their neighborhood and how we can better help them. Because if we don't know the issue, then we can't help. And who better knows it than the community and then reaching them we also want to build them up to be leaders in the future so that they can be the ones that are standing for their community because we are just their help and their guide. We are not the people that are running the show. We make sure that the community is that. Then we network with other groups, um, part of the Black Environmental Collective, our water campaign, get the let out campaign, making sure that we are a part of all these tables and making sure we know what the resources are that we can collect and give to the community that we can share with other groups so that everybody knows what's out there and what's available for the residents that they have. Then we go out and we plan out actionable steps with the community. One thing that happens in a lot of our work is people get into planning and they just keep planning and they keep planning and nothing seems to be actionable that's happening with that planning. So we ensure that we are doing something physical, whether it's rallying, whether it's doing an action um, against the people who are polluting our communities, showing up to council meetings, board meetings, making sure that we are doing actions with the community um, and for the community to make sure that we are pushing along these policies that we need. And then last, but certainly not least, we put pressure on decision makers, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about in my last slide. But our biggest thing is we wanna make sure that people who are making the decisions for these actions are being held accountable for those decisions because these communities didn't just wake up and get impacted by pollutants. People made decisions to put these companies here. People made decisions to go above their standard regulations. So we wanna make sure that they are being accounted for for those issues. Cause a lot of times, especially in smaller municipalities, we find that a lot of the people who are making these decisions aren't really having their feet put to the fire for them. So in a lot of our tables, we have two people that actually affect our city with water. That is the PWSA, Pittsburgh Water Sewer Authority. And a lot of the issues that we have with them is their lead line replacement. Even though it is going on and we are so happy with the work that is being done, there's still so much more that needs to be done. And there's still so many, so many people who have put in complaints that have expressed their issues um, with their lines that still haven't had that replacement happen. Um, we also have a stormwater fee that PWSA is pointing out, um, trying to get people educated on what that actually means. Every time we bring it up, people are like, what is a stormwater fee? Are they adding that to my bill? And it's actually something that's already on the bill. Um, but the purpose of the stormwater fee is to ensure that people who have bigger parking lots like Home Depot and Walmart are paying the cost for all the overflow and stormwater that they're bringing into the sewer systems. We also want to make sure that we do not privatize our water. When we privatize our water, we don't get a lot of the customer assistance program, as I'm going to talk about <laughs> Wilkinsburg Pen Joint. Um, there aren't a lot of hardship um, hardship programs that are put in place. There are not a lot of lead line replacements. There are not a lot of things that the community can benefit from when water is privatized. So we always want to make sure that we are not going to have a privatized water with PWSA, which previously was an issue and concern, but has since been shut down thanks to the voices of the community and our water table. Um, the billing that they have with Alcasan, a lot of people, when they bring up PWSA, they don't really mention Alcasan a lot. Um, and even though, you know, they are on the same bill, they are two different facilities, they have two different boards, um, they go by two different systems. And so we try to educate people around, hey, yes, they are on the same bill and you're getting, you're paying them through the um, same system but the way that they're functioning is different. And the rules that they have, if we apply to PWSA, it doesn't automatically apply to Alcasan. So we have to 
tackle both of them. And then the Green First Plan. Unfortunately, I don't know the current status of the Green First Plan, but it was a plan that was made by PDOSA to incorporate green infrastructure um, into sites to capture the stormwater is a plan that, you know, definitely needs some work, but it hasn't fully been adopted yet, unfortunately, but it's definitely a plan that most communities have been very for and want, want to have implemented because a lot of the development that people are trying to do around the infrastructure of piping is just to put these tunnels and put bigger pipes and do everything except trying to do the natural way of putting in green infrastructure to collect that water. With Wilkinsburg Pin Joint, it is a different situation. So this is a water authority that covers um, some of Homewood, and I think Ms. Z could probably tell later where that line border is. And it also covers a whole bunch of smaller municipalities outside of Homewood into Wilkinsburg, into Penn Hills, and farther down even into West Mifflin. This is a company that doesn't have a lead line replacement plan. They don't have customer assistance programs um, that are feasible for their customers. They are board led, so their board makes the decisions of you know, what their regulations are gonna be. And they are not PUC regulated, which is our public utility commission, um, which PWSA is, and they abide by the regulations that were set by them. But Wilkinsburg Pin Joint does not have to follow those regulations. And those regulations are more strict than the ones from EPA, um, the Allegheny County Health Department, and the DER, um, which I always forget how to pronounce that acronym, um, but it's the Energy um, Commission that focuses on a lot of the utility regulations as well, but they are very lenient in their regulations, which is why a lot of people prefer to have water authorities that are PUC regulated. Uh, and I'm sorry. And we also have, um, if anybody is interested, shameless plug, um, there is a Life Without Lead um, Summit that is going on October 28th, where we will have a whole bunch of people talking. I'll be there. Um, a lot of other people who work in these water issues will be there to talk about the lead issue that is going on in our county. So for current policies that we are focused on right now, we have the stormwater fee, which I already talked about, the lead safe ordinance, which is a ordinance that has been adopted in other um, states as New York and Maryland have right now that we're trying to get in Pennsylvania to ensure that developers and people who are working on homes are ensuring that those homes are less safe, that when they do demolitions, that they're not putting, you know, lead pipes into the ground or having lead based paint being re put into the ground, that they're actually taking the steps to ensure that our spaces are less safe and that if a child tests um, with a with any lead level, um, but right now it's like a, if they test a higher lead level, then they would get this service for free um, because it would show that the child is being affected and could lead to lead poisoning. So in order to stop that, a lot of states have been putting this ordinance in so that the whole state has to follow this, which can reduce the lead toxicity for children greatly. We also have the PA Green New Deal, um, which is focused on climate change and job transition. So a lot of these facilities don't have a lot of laborers in them. And a lot of the green infrastructure work that we want doesn't have people that can work those jobs either. So with the Green New Deal and also with the Reggie policy, they want to put money towards training people to do these green jobs so that we can not only have people who are coming out of these coal mining, these factory jobs have a job to go to, but these jobs are contributing to greener plans and greener infrastructure and green energy plans. Um, and the people that work at these other facilities can get trained to have those jobs um, when the facilities that are doing these emissions are closed down. Um, because from the president to a lot of these policies that have been passed, we need to get to zero emissions by technically 2030, but I think the new year is 2050. 
and the infrastructure bill. Um, I know that we have our one that's passed in the city already, which did include lead line replacement, which um, Women for Healthy Environment is, I think that our water table as well is being involved in making sure that that money is being spent properly with the lead line replacements. Um, and the same thing goes for some of the ARPA funds in some of the smaller municipalities. Um, we're trying to make sure that municipalities outside the city also get this lead line replacement with their infrastructure bill, um, that the funds have not been allocated yet. And with the regional greenhouse gas bill, the Reggie bill, they are also trying to put money into making these facilities work better, have newer equipment, because a lot of the facilities that we have now have older equipment, which leads to a lot of the toxicities that we see. So lastly, I wanted to talk more about accountability. Um, just so y'all know, this picture that is here, I didn't originally put it there. It came with the template, but I kept it because it was a really important point for me when I saw it um, to what I'm talking about with accountability. A lot of children are getting sick from these lead toxins. Children are the most vulnerable. Um, children are ones that are getting the lead poisoning from all these toxicities that we have. And we need to make sure that the people that are, are harming our children's health are being held accountable for that. So we have many groups that are involved in a lot of these decisions when it comes to the policies of our water. Um, first, starting with our Public Utility Commission. Like I said, they do not cover all um, facilities, but they are a commission that when they have a new standard set, all the people that are under them, all the municipalities that are under them have to follow that. And they do have an opening right now um, for a new commissioner. Um, that people are trying to get more community focused people into. Um, I don't know if you all know about the president that's there. Her name is Ms. Gladys. She is a black woman has been really working hard to ensure that the stuff that PUC is doing is more diverse and inclusive. So very happy for that and hoping that the new person is like that as well. Then we have our Alcasan, our PWSA and our Wilkinsburg Penn Joint Boards. Boards are very important. They are the people that are passing these changes to their regulations and their laws within their facilities. And they are the ones that we need to be pushing for to make these changes. Um, a lot of people look at just the executive director, but the board is the one that makes these final decisions. Then we have our Allegheny County Health Department, which not only is supposed to ensure that we have safe water, but also safe air and clean environments. And they are supposed to be particularly focusing on our low income black and brown communities. And they have not been doing a very good job of that, unfortunately. Um, and now a lot of people are coming more to their meetings and being more vocal about them enforcing a lot more stricter regulations. Because as you saw for Wilkinsburg Penn Joint, they do have to follow Allegheny County Health Department's regulations. So if they change theirs to be more strict, then people like Wilkinsburg Penn Joint will have to follow. We also have the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. I'm sure a lot of people know about them. Um, we do have a Southwestern environmental justice um, office for the EPA that is becoming more involved in the conversations of helping our communities, which I think is gonna become a great asset. Um, and they are willing to help us push these people along more as well. And then of course, our own city, our own city council, all of the people that are in our sustainability department, these are the people that also make decisions that can affect how these policies are changed and run. Um, they can put more emphasis and rules on the regulations, especially when it's harming the health of the community. So I just want to put a call to action that if you all are able to, because I know 
meetings are usually early in the morning and there are a lot of them, but coming to these meetings and making public comments and making sure that your voice is heard is very important because they document those, they record those. And when we have like petitions and send those out, it shows that this is a real big concern that it's not just the same five people that are coming to their meeting complaining about this, that there's a big group of people that want to see this change and that the community is behind them because we are their voters. We are the people that vote them into these positions. So if we are saying we don't want that and then the person we vote in doesn't do that, then they become more in fear of, oh, they might not vote for me. So we have way more power than a lot of people tend to believe. So I always try to say, make sure your voice is heard, make sure you're having conversations with people and make sure that we are all out there pushing for a better environment. And I'm just going to end with what we like to chant and a lot of people like to chant when we're advocating is that when we fight, we win. If we stay silent, nothing happens. When we raise our voice and we make our voices heard and say that enough is enough and we keep doing that, we don't let up on it, we do win. And I encourage everybody once again to always have those conversations with everybody, have uncomfortable conversations, make sure that you are helping educate people on these issues because education is one of the biggest things that we focus on when engaging people because a lot of people don't know who is in charge of their water and who makes what decisions. So each one teach one. And that is the end of my presentation i'll stop sharing <laughs> awesome thank you so much natisha we really appreciate all the work that you do on behalf of environmental justice in the region um you are a true champion i want to stop here and ask if miss zena or dr emily elliott um have any thoughts any questions anything riveting that they heard um from natisha that you wanted to just kind of insert before we moved on I heard something that I was unaware of, and I did not realize Wilkinsburg uh, Penn Joint Water Authority had to follow the health department's guidelines. Uh, that means some of us need to go to their board meetings and make sure it's happening. Yeah, it's actually on their website too. Like that whole list is on their website of regulations that they follow. So thank you, Natisha, for that information. Awesome. Yeah, I, I, I thought that I had the same sort of idea in question. It's really confusing, like which utilities are under the jurisdiction of PUC and which aren't. So are there any like rules of thumb to know which ones are subject to PUC oversight? Yeah, PUC actually has a list of that um, on their website. They have a list of all the utilities that are under them. And I think, you know, if you click a state, they send you the list of um, the utilities within that area. Um, and then a lot of municipalities, they have on their like site that with regulations they follow. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. It's mainly anything that's a private water company doesn't have to be under the PUC. Public water companies do. Awesome. Thank you both for chiming in. Wanted to make sure that we're all learning from each other. Once again, thank you, Natisha. Um, we're going to move on to Dr. Emily Elliott. She is a professor at the Department of Geology and Environmental Science at the University of Pittsburgh, my alma mater, director and co-founder of the Pittsburgh Collaboratory for, uh, for Water Research, Education, and Outreach that bridges efforts in water research, governance, and action at the University of Pittsburgh. She is trained as a science ambassador through the National Academies of Sciences, Science and Engineering Ambassador Program, and the 2018 recipient of the American Geophysical Union Salzman Award, say that three times, for excellence in education and mentoring. <laughs> this is probably so cringeworthy, Dr. Elliott. Um, she is passionate about the importance of interdisciplinary geosciences for addressing sustainability challenges, advancing diversity and inclusion in the geosciences, community engaged research, which is important, and science communication. We are so happy to have you here, Dr. Elliott, and the floor is all yours. 
Thank you so much. I, I am not deserving of that intro. Thank you so much. Um, I want to, uh, again, thank John Rubin and the Science Revealed team um, for putting this panel together, um, as well as Darren and the other panelists. Um, it is a real privilege to be here. Um, okay, so we know that there is no question that the Pittsburgh region is the economic engine for Southwestern Pennsylvania. And a big part of that economic engine is touting this moniker of America's most livable city and America's most livable blah, blah, blah. But the reality um, is that, you know, it's not livable for everyone. And um, in contrast to, um, these proclamations, persisting inequities exist in race, class, and gender, um, and environmental justice issues. So, um, you know, in terms of how people experience water inequities, like what, what is that? What does that term mean? Well, um, if you go forward, okay, so if we, if we, start with the principle that everyone has the right to clean water and sanitation. There are lots of things that can impact that. Things like affordability that were mentioned, access, um, whether you have you know, stream water available to young children to play with, um, whether you have water coming out of your tap, um, flooding issues like basement flooding or street flooding from stormwater runoff, water quality issues, um, if creeks exist, are they safe to even wade in or let your pet walk in? Um, lots of infrastructure issues, in particular infrastructure improvement issues and making sure that any funds dedicated to infrastructure improvements are done so in an equitable manner. And then, you know, the, you know, one of the most profound ways um, that folks are impacted is through lead exposure. And I think, the incidences that have stemmed from PWSAs and Pittsburgh's own lead crisis have shed a lot of light and much needed attention on these issues. Um, so next slide. Next, okay, thank you. So uh, this is some data from the Allegheny County Health Department that shows the percent of children under six that have blood lead levels greater than five micrograms per deciliter. Um, and keep in mind that there is no safe level of lead exposure, but in these communities in the darkest blue, up to 14% of children younger than six have unacceptable blood lead levels. And um, I think a lot of times it's easy to get lost in the numbers and the statistics and the maps and the graphs. But the reality is we're talking about real people, real people's children that have, you know, their futures impacted by what they're exposed to. Um, next slide, please. So there is no safe level of lead exposure in children that's been identified by the CDC. And some of the impacts include damage to the brain and nervous system, slowed growth and development, hearing problems and speech problems, learning and behavior problems. And overall, these impacts can lower IQ, decrease children's ability to pay attention and um, cause underperformance at school. And not only are these like our most precious assets, but they're also our future leaders in the region. And so it's really critical um, that we turn our full attention to making sure that um, all those lead lines are removed and that they're done so in an equitable manner. Next slide, please. So we are lucky in this region um, to have people like Natisha and Alyssa and just some amazing organizations doing a lot of hard work to document what inequities exist related to water. So one of those groups is the Water Alliance, which just this year published a new report um, about an equitable water future in Pittsburgh. And then another group is Women for the Healthy Environment that also published a report this year 
um, called Something's in the Water. And both of these reports took a deep dive into trying to identify what inequities exist. But moreover, they um, highlighted some potential steps forward. So, you know, in, in terms of getting to the action part that Natisha was talking about, what are the things we can do? And some of the things that they mentioned in those reports are things like rebuild trust in water systems, prioritize equity in infrastructure improvements, strengthen bill assistance efforts, codify moratoriums on shutoffs, prevent sewer backups, create workforce development plans to diversify the pipeline of water sector jobs, and expand the use of advisory bodies in water municipalities. Next slide. So um, at the University of Pittsburgh, we're working to advance some of these goals set forth by these organizations with a new interdisciplinary team. Um, and this team is led by Dr. Caitlin Shoring, um, who some of you may know here, uh, newly minted Dr. Shoring, um, who has a long history of working in these communities and a deep knowledge of water governance issues as well as Dr. Maria Gonzalez Rivas um, from the Graduate School of Public Health and Affairs and Dr. Noble Masaru, um, a specialist in public health and human rights in the School of Public Health. <coughs> and then our group, I'm sorry, our group comes into play because um, the Water Collaboratory is an agglomeration of scientists and faculty from across disciplines at the university with a real interest in um, trying to apply some of the tools that we have to help um, address some regional problems. So next slide, please. So um, again, getting to that action point, some of the things that we are looking forward to doing as part of this new water equity team we are teaming up for women, with Women for the Healthy Environment to create new knowledge. So we're specifically looking to create powerful visualizations or maps that document existing inequities and use these images to stress the urgency and need for change and share these images widely with residents, water utilities, the Public Utilities Commission, et cetera. Um, one of the other things that we are embarking on with this group is creating minimum acceptable transparency standards for operations by regional water utilities, and then evaluating regional water utilities against these standards. Um, so that way comparisons among utilities will be possible and you'll have you know, some documentation of, of where different utilities are falling short. Next slide. Uh, okay, so we would love to hear from you. Um, you can reach out to the Water Collaboratory uh, to sign up and learn about our new events on our webpage. But you know, more importantly, our ears are open to hear your ideas, your problems, what needs attention, what would be useful. Um, so please feel free to reach out to myself or Dr. Shoring or, or Megan Guy, who's our outreach coordinator. Thank you. Awesome. Dr. Elliot, thank you so much. Um, wanted to see if our other panelists heard anything interesting, have a question for Dr. Elliot, um, Natisha, Ms. Zena. Information was great. Thank you, Dr. Elliot. Um, no, you were very uh, precise, understood it. Thank you. Awesome. Natisha? Yeah, also, thank you for the work. <laughs> Information visualizations are so helpful when trying mm -hmm. to like show people how the impact is, especially mm -hmm. on maps. When you show them like this is how many people are being affected, mm -hmm. it's it's real big difference between you just saying it and them actually. Right. Saying it. So thank you. Uh, yeah. So you know, if you have ideas for things that you'd like to see shown in those visualizations, please reach out to us because we're sort of collecting ideas now and brainstorming about what we could do. And so we would love to hear your thoughts. Oh yeah, I'll reach out. 
Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Elliot. Mm -hmm. It's great to meet you um, this way and great to work with you on this panel. You're awesome. Last but certainly not, not least, we have Ms. Zena Scott. Uh, she is a long-term resident expert, advocate, and cheerleader of the Homewood area. In her now retired years, she's one of Pittsburgh's most notable community activists and continues to serve her communities by participating as a board member in local spaces such as Operation Better Block, Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy, Upstream Pittsburgh, and the Harriet Tubman Guild. When she's not serving, she's hanging out with her grandchildren, catching new movies, reading, spending time with friends, bowling, although she's not very good, exercising, traveling, enjoying life, and smelling the roses. Miss Zena, it's always a pleasure and an honor to work and hear from you, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great introduction. I'll adopt you as one of my children, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, the biggest part of what I want to say to everyone, and I want you please, please, please to pass it on. Everyone, whether it's Pittsburgh, outside of Pittsburgh, has a right to clean drinking water. That is a right. We're in the United States, not a third world country. We have certain rights. Um, I am a... Uh, person that gets my water from Wilkinsburg Pen Joint Water Authority. And I am a thorn in their side is the best way to put it. Next slide, please. Thank you. Do you know, if you're in, let me say this, if you're in the Wilkinsburg Pen Joint Water Authority system, do you know how they test their water? When they test it, who did they test it with? How often? Those are all things that you should know. It's like going to the doctor. You ask him, why am I taking this medicine? What's the outcome of it? When do you expect me to be better? In this case, we don't know these things. They tell us they test 10%. And I want to know if it's in the newer neighborhoods or is it in the low income neighborhoods where most of us in low income neighborhoods live in older homes where we have uh, lead water lines coming into our home? Uh, reality is no one changes their water line unless they have to, or unless like in the city of Pittsburgh, when they change the water lines in the street, they are now changing your lead lines so that you have healthy drinking water. Wilkinsburg Pen Joint didn't do that. They did the lines in the street, but they didn't do the lines coming to your house. I understand now after Natisha's uh, presentation, and I went on the health department's website, Wilkinsburg Pen now has to change the water lines coming into your house. Question is, are they changing it at your expense or at their expense? They did receive a grant of uh, over $9 million to replace about 1,000 lead service lines. That's not very many service lines in the 22 communities that they service. My question to them is, whose neighborhood are they changing those lines in? Again, is it in your more affluent neighborhoods or is it in the neighborhoods that truly need it? And I'm not sure if we'll ever get an answer because they're known for not responding. So thank you for this. Create customer assistant programs. They don't have one, they need one. When your water bill's behind, they want the money or they're going to cut your water off. They don't have a problem doing that and they do do it. Um, I'm not for sure if it's on the next slide, but I'm gonna throw it out there right now. Uh, if you have a death in your family and the water is in that person's name, 
if you want to change it over to your name, if your name isn't on the home, they won't change it. And I had to go back and look at my bill, which will come up later on in a slide. And you'll notice the last name on my bill is not my last name. Thank you. If uh, they blacked it out, which is okay. I'm okay with that. I can tell it because it's me. My bill comes in under a Mazena Williams. That's not me. I'm a Mazena Scott. I was Williams at one time. I went to change the bill because I didn't change the name on the ownership of my house at the same time. Uh, they wouldn't change my bill over. So that's a problem because you cannot change ownership legally on who owns a house overnight. It takes uh, a lot of paperwork and money to do it. So when people are trying to be honest about paying their bills, uh, Wilkinsburg Pen Joint Water Authority doesn't allow you to be honest. With that, since this is up, this is how my bill comes. One is the back part of the bill, the other is the front part. Where you see it blacked out at, it is not blacked out when I get the bill. So anyone that sees my bill can get the account number, my name, my address. It's all there out and open for everybody to see. In this day and age, with all the identity theft going on, this is a travesty. This should not be happening. We should be getting our bills in a sealed envelope that just has our address on the front of it coming to us. I have actually received three people's bills at one time. And when I say that is because it has come off in some way, either from who makes their bills or from the post office, they've been stuck together. So it comes out with my address on the front, what's on the back is what you see here. But when I pick it apart, I've got two other people's bills. I am very honest, so I give it back to the post office, explain what's happened so they can mail it further. In this case, some people may not be that way. It may toss somebody's water bill in the garbage. Along with that, we have many people that have said they've gotten their water bill today and a disconnect notice the next day. They are not very polite with disconnect notices. They are not easy with disconnect notices. You see me up on my slide, I have, have customer service training. They need to do that because when you call and you get one service person, they may tell you one thing. And if you call back the next day and you get another person, you may be told something else. And that does not make sense at all, not to me. Everybody should be on the same page and giving out the same information. Uh, back to the customer assistance program. We've just come through a very hard time. Our times are not up. Many people are out of jobs. They can't get daycare for them to go back to work. They have no customer assistance program. If you owe them, they want it. They're not willing to wait at all. One of the other things that I don't like is we have no representation on the board for city residents. So that you understand what city residents get water from Wilkinsburg Pen Joint Water uh, Association is the people that are in the zip code of 15221. Uh, most of Homewood is 15208. But there are areas in Homewood, such as where I live, East Hills, and anywhere between myself and East Hills is 15221. We are a city of Pittsburgh, not Wilkinsburg. And our water comes from Wilkinsburg Pen Joint Water Authority, but we have no one on their board that we can call and complain to and say, this is happening to us, what do we do? Um, their board is comprised of 13 seats, if I'm not mistaken, and they are supposed to be for five years that the person sits on the board. Many of those people are what I call the good old voice club. They have been there for 30 years. No one's ever changed them. 
They just keep sitting there year after year after year after year. But I don't see them trying to improve the water quality or the service they give to their customers. They're definitely not of the uh, persuasion that as a customer, you're always right. Um, that's number one. And see number two, as a customer, you're always right. They do not think in those terms. I think I have another slide and I may not. That was the bill slide. Okay, I'm good. Any questions? Thank you, Ms. Z. Uh, wanted to open it up to our panelists um, for any response that they have for you. Uh, any questions, thoughts? Yeah. I uh, Natisha, you went back on mute. Sorry, I was just going to say, I didn't really think about having like a city resident on the board, but that makes like 100 percent sense. Um, and there isn't that representation. So definitely something to go after. I don't know how like their turn, like how they're voted in, but we should definitely work on that. I'm sure. So they're you. assigned, they're assigned by their council from the districts they come from in order to get someone from the city on there our mayor would have to request it. Um, so I haven't been able to get that through. So yeah. I'm hoping when uh, we get a new mayor that we can possibly cross that bridge at that time. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Dr. Elliot, any question? I know we have about five or six minutes. So do you want me to just dive in? to some human, okay, perfect. I have a question for all of you. Uh, if we can crunch it into one minute, um, we have about four minutes left. What is everyone's one call to action? I, it's, a, it's a very tricky question, um, but I do believe that in order to move forward, everybody has to pick up a little bit of the work and do their part. So what do you believe your call to action is in this environmental justice space? And feel free anyone to jump in. I, for one, want representation on the board. I would say getting uncomfortable. Um, a lot of people have had this issue for so long that it's just normal to them. And they are just like, oh, well, it hasn't worked in so long. Why should I do something now? and they choose to just be comfortable in the status quo. And I just try to urge people, you, you gotta get uncomfortable or nothing will change. Yeah, I, from my perspective, I think, you know, using what little power you have to advocate for change, you know, and there are lots of ways to do that. But in these academic environments, a lot of times what we do is cut off from the reality of what people are living every day. And you know, there's not a lot of ways that students can stay connected to those communities. So, you know, just use what you have to, to affect change. Awesome. And Natisha, we have one question for you. Um, you mentioned Pittsburgh's unsafe lead level starting in 2016. I also mentioned that earlier. Did something happen to change the to change? Um, did, some, did something change to raise the lead levels in 2016 or did it just happen to be detected by then? Um, and how does industrial pollution affect Pittsburgh's drinking water? Yeah, so um, when PWSA and I think it was PA American Water, was that their partner? Who was their private partner? Viola. I never, Viola. Thank you so much. <laughs> so they had um, a co-partnership um, with a private consultant and they were trusting out new chemicals in the water um, to try to clean out the water. That chemical ended up eroding um, the inside of our pipes, which exposed the lead of our pipes even more to our water, which led us into what they even have stated as a lead crisis that happened here in Pittsburgh um, because it spiked the levels up like so quickly, so bad. 
um, and it eroded not only just like our main pipes, but like the private lines as well. Um, so I don't remember the second part, but that's how our lead issue started. Well, it didn't just like start there, but it got exacerbated very much from that situation. Okay, any other thoughts from anyone else on the panel? I can, I can address the industrial waste issue. Um, the US EPA used to have an interface where you could easily search um, by location to see what uh, utilities or industries nearby were um, releasing waste to the water um, and from the air. And um, that, that went offline for a while during the last administration and we're hoping that it, it comes back up. But certainly, you know, this region has a long history of using the water as a resource instead of an asset, you know, and, um, you know, we have over 400 combined sewer overflows discharging to the rivers in addition to those industrial outputs, so. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Elliott. We have reached our time. We're about at three o'clock. Once again, um, I want to thank our host, University of Pittsburgh Community Engagement Center, of course, their, their director, Darren Ellerby, our partners and our panelists so much. We were very excited to engage in this conversation. Please read up on wild water in Pittsburgh. Um, please read up about how you can be a better advocate and please read up on what kind of calls to action that you can take up on and being a better ambassador for safe environments and sustainability throughout Pittsburgh. So once again, thank you everyone. Muchly appreciated for you for joining in and thank you to the University of Pittsburgh for hosting Civic Week. I wanna thank you for the work that you've done with this panel. And I mm -hmm. have people go back to what you said when you first started the panel. Test your water, get containers that you can filter your water. You said all that at the beginning. And if you remember what you said, I would like you to repeat it, Alicia. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yes, sure. My three calls to actions were, please attend uh, your, local, your local meetings. They might be locally grounded, but they're definitely nationally relevant issues. Test and filter your drinking water and the water that you're using. And if you can, we know that we acknowledge it all. Um, please act on environmental racism in your own right. Those were my three call to actions that I wanted to make sure I put out there in the beginning of the session. So thank you, Ms. Zena. And Darren, were you going to say anything? I was just snapping my fingers. Um, thank you so much, Alyssa. Uh, I am. I, I, I'm. I can't say I'm impressed because I'm not surprised. This is. This is why we needed you. Thank you to all of our panelists. Um, Y'all showed up and showed out today. That information was amazing. Thank you to everyone who showed up at the CEC to watch this in person, and thank you to everyone watching on YouTube and Facebook Live. We're out. Oh, shout out to Jamil Bay. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone. <laughs>